Located in the western Sierra Nevada of Central California, bounded on the southeast by the Sierra National Forest and on the northwest by the Stanislaus National Forest, lies a beautiful, vast wilderness that attracts over 4 million people every year. Officially federally protected in 1864 and later declared a national park on the 1st of October 1890 by a Congressional Act, the Yosemite National Park was officially born. This expansive land, covering almost 1,200 square miles, was officially designated as a World Heritage Site in 1984. Perhaps best known for its captivating waterfalls, it's also famous for its clear streams, ancient and giant sequoia groves, its lakes, mountains, meadows and glaciers. It is also home to one of the world's natural wonders, Yosemite Valley. According to NationalGeographic.com, this valley stretches 8 miles from east to west with granite walls more than twice the height of the Empire State Building. Carved by glacial dynamics and weathering and erosion spanning 30 million years, this is a wonder of the natural world. The National Park Service describes the valley as a shrine to human foresight with the strength of its granite, its persistence of life and the tranquility of the High Sierra. But not all is tranquil in the National Park. Yosemite National Park in recent times has also become well known for its disappearances that many claim to be unusual. The earliest listed unexplained disappearance in Yosemite by the National Park Service is that of F.P. Shepard. Shepard first moved to the United States in 1902. Prior to this, he lived in England with his family, but the jewellery company, known as Shreve & Co, had hunted him and wanted his expertise in their team. Unfortunately, his family did not join him in California, but Shreve & Co was said to be good to him and allowed him to take time off every now and then to go back home to England to visit his loved ones. Shreve & Co paid for his accommodation at the Concord Hotel on Clay Street in San Francisco and whilst there, he became very close friends with the Rice family. Dr. Rice described Shepard as an incredibly caring and an intelligent individual. He also said that Shepard was great in the outdoors and that he had a lot of experience. In Dr. Rice's own words, this is how he described his friend. Shepard was as noble a fellow as any ever drew breath. At 25 years of age, he had for a number of years been the sole support of his sister, Mrs. Margaret Lewis and her two children back in Birmingham in the UK. They were his only relatives and he devoted his whole life to their welfare. He was of a decided, literary turn and had written a number of poems and essays which were published in English periodicals. While in San Francisco, he attended the night school regularly and recently had been devoting his evenings to the study of French. For seven years, Shepard lived in peace and prospered at the company, but things would take a dark turn. On this Thursday afternoon, Shepard, along with his party of friends, was staying at the Glacier Point Hotel with the intention of ascending to Sentinel Dome. Most members of the group were said to be female and everyone present was high in spirits at the start of the hike. In fact, this hike was said to be full of laughter and banter among the group of friends. However, at some point, heavy fog engulfed the party and everyone present abandoned the trip everyone apart from Shepard. Shepard was said to have laughed and remarked that he guessed he'd try to make it. That wasn't meant to be quite as ominous at the time. While the others were making their way back to the hotel, Shepard set off down the trail and out of view of the others. That was the last time he was ever seen. The rest of the group made it back to the hotel and waited for Shepard, but when the evening fell, an air of anxiety manifested within the conversation. 
That evening, they realised that Shepard was not coming back and reported him missing. The official search began the following morning, where several parties were formed. Soldiers from a troop of the United States Cavalry were sent in first to find the missing man. Another group was formed by members of the original group of friends and others present at the hotel. And finally, experienced guides in the area also banded together to bring Shepard home. There were many people involved in this search and meticulous search plans were formed by the search and rescue leaders. The woods were scoured as a result and all members present were calling out for Shepard throughout the entirety of the search. The guides believed that they would be able to find him but they couldn't locate any trace of him. At some point during the search, the area was hit with heavy fog again and it had to be postponed because visibility became increasingly reduced. On the 19th of June, the Oakland Tribune newspaper stated this, The lost man was without food or blankets and a heavy drizzle of rain shrouded the whole country when he set forth. Today, a thorough exploration of every ridge and canyon within miles of the hotel is being made. He will no doubt be found before night. Unfortunately, the prediction made by the experts and the newspapers would not ring true, and when the failed search left all present baffled, bloodhounds were brought in. Days after the initial disappearance, the San Francisco Call reported this. From canyon to peak, the hounds will feel their way, led by the peculiar memory of an odour sniffed from a glove. Seldom has a more precarious scent been followed by the bloodhounds and rarely has a wilder country been scouted for a lost person by dogs. It is thought that the only hope of finding Shepard rests with the dogs. Four cavalrymen and tourists in the valley have for four days searched the mountainsides for the missing man and have given up hope. It was reported from the Yosemite Valley last evening that the cavalrymen who had been searching for Shepard returned to their camp discouraged. They had not found a trace of the young man. 25 of the soldiers went as far as Illouette Canyon, but to no purpose. It is feared that the wild canyons bordering the valley have claimed another victim. The San Francisco Call also said something very unusual under the subheading of Minotaur Sacrifice. They said, Young Shepherd may be the sacrifice which seems yearly to be paid among the tourists to the valley as to the fabled Minotaur in compensation for the pleasure which the valley gives. I have absolutely no idea what they mean by this, and after researching the area, I could find no mention of a Minotaur or any similar legend in the area. Perhaps they were just poetically speaking about a vast number of disappearances in the area, as they seem to be suggesting that at least one person would go missing in Yosemite Valley every year. In this instance though, the dog search failed and they never picked up his scent at any point during the hunt. In fact, even 110 years later now, no trace of Mr. Shepard has ever been found. The searchers were said to have come away from the search gutted and feeling like they should have been able to find him. But that was not the only disappearance in Yosemite National Park. Photography enthusiast Frank Coneman made the trip to Yosemite on the 31st of May 1925. Frank was a person that loved the outdoors and he also enjoyed his own company, so decided to rent a tent in Camp Curry. He was an avid hiker and his goal was simple, to hike around the national park and to take home some memories documented on his camera. For the next 10 days, other individuals at the camp said that Frank was often alone and that they always saw him carrying his photography equipment around and snapping pictures. They described Frank as being polite and well-spoken and that he was always very friendly to everyone that he came across. They said that he always seemed to be in the search of the perfect picture but always had time for other people and would help others who didn't quite share his level of expertise with the camera. On June the 11th, Frank went out as he usually would on another photography expedition in the park, but something was different, this time he didn't return. Those present at Camp Curry did realise that Frank was gone, but didn't think much of it. In their minds, Frank was simply out taking pictures and then had returned to his life in the big city. It's worth mentioning that many visit the park each year and they typically come and go all the time. That was the reasoning as to why no one was really that concerned at the time. 
On June the 18th, exactly one week since Frank was last seen, Frank's workplace made contact with Camp Curry to inquire about his whereabouts as he was due back to work two days prior on the 16th. Park rangers identified Frank's tent and upon opening it, discovered his suitcase, camera case and various photography supplies, but needless to say, Frank was not present. The rangers spoke with other campers and hikers, but received conflicting information. Frank seems to have told some people that he was going to Inspiration Point to take photos, but others stated that they had seen him specifically strap his camera to his back and head off in the direction of Yosemite Falls. This is a problem, because the two are effectively in opposite directions. However, the rangers did have two places to begin their search. Many individuals volunteered and joined the search, and together, all trails in the area were scoured. There was no sign of him at either Yosemite Falls or Inspiration Point. Searchers noted that there was nothing to indicate that a struggle had taken place, as nothing was found to even hint in that direction. Frank Coneman, nor any of his belongings, were ever found. Now there are numerous disappearances that have been described as odd that have taken place after this one, but let's have a look at more recent times. In Yosemite, on the 9th of July, 1995, the park was incredibly clear, sunny, and warm, which are not the conditions in which you would expect someone to vanish without a trace very easily. However, that is precisely what happened to 37-year-old Jeannie Hesselschwertz after driving from Fresno to the park with her boyfriend, Mike Monahan. They had been living together for over 10 years and had been in a relationship for even longer. On this particular day, the pair had planned to spend some time hiking and taking in the views that the park has to offer. It's said that they travelled via Highway 41 and arrived at Yosemite at approximately 10am. They travelled on Glacier Point Road, which is a fairly desolate highway which to my knowledge is only open during the summer. Now, things get a bit questionable here. During their travel to Glacier Point, which is not far north from the Panorama Trail and slightly further adrift to the northeast of Sentinel Dome, they for some reason pulled over near Summit Meadow and decided to separate for a short time and each went on their own hike. The plan was to meet back up at the car so Mike took his binoculars and set himself up in an area where he thought that he could do some bird watching. It's not clear in which direction Jeannie set off but she didn't want to do bird watching and instead went for a short hike. However, after 15 minutes had passed, Mike returned to the car and waited for Jeannie. After 5 minutes or so, he began asking other hikers and park employees if they had seen her. However, no one could recall seeing anyone matching her description. She was wearing leather hiking boots, a t-shirt, walking shorts without a backpack or supplies. Mike had a brief search, but after realising the sheer scale of the area and the denseness of the forest became worried and at 12.30 in the afternoon, he drove to the park rangers. Fortunately, they were located only several minutes away from the car. Within just 45 minutes, the park rangers descended on the scene and spread out to find her. After searching for an hour and 15 minutes, they had absolutely no idea what had happened nor where she'd gone, and at this point, the park service dispatched a helicopter. From what I understand, this helicopter was fitted with thermal imaging technology and at no point did it locate Genie. This search continued for the entirety of the day, but the searchers never found anything to indicate where she might have gone. The following morning would see eight separate highly trained search dog teams join the search effort. The handlers took their dogs on and off the trail, but they only circled and then travelled back to their initial location at the roadside. This led the handlers to believe that Jeannie was not in the forest and some speculated that she could have met foul play. Of course, this made some question as to whether her boyfriend Mike had anything to do with this. After all, there was some strangeness with the pair separating. The search and rescue operation continued on, which to this day was the largest search in Yosemite's history. Hundreds upon hundreds of people, including firemen and professional search and rescue teams from all over the state, combed over 40 square miles and nothing was found. The FBI dispatched agents to the park and they took Mike for questioning. 
Mike declared his innocence and passed the polygraph test. The agent searched his vehicle and found no evidence to indicate that Mike had brought any harm to Jeannie and he was dropped as a suspect. But this left everyone with a very strange question. If Mike had nothing to do with her disappearance, where did she go and why couldn't they find any trace of her? During the rescue operation, searchers made a strange discovery. They said that two clear footprints matching her footwear had been found. However, one was near the car while the other was near the Brida Vale to Yosemite Valley Trail. They never found any of the footprints between the two locations which searchers did find odd. But that wasn't the only oddity with that finding. Searchers believed that if Jeannie was lost and then managed to find that particular trail, then she would have walked down it until she found help. At this point, a radius was created around the boot print near the trail and the area was scoured. But still, the searchers couldn't locate her and the dogs did not pick up her scent. After some time, the official search scaled down and would eventually reach its inconclusive end. After this, Maureen McConnell, the friend of Jeannie's roommate, called a tracker school to see if they could assist with the still ongoing unofficial search. Head of the school, Tom Brown Jr. did send a tracker down to assist and he interviewed her present friends, searchers, family and Mike, as he wanted to gather an understanding of her experience, habits and personality. He then spoke with the park ranger who was in charge of planning much of the prior search. He composed a profile of Jeannie and tried to understand what she might have done. The tracker detailed that when entering the forest, as the wind blew through the leaves, it sounded similar to cars driving by on a paved road. He said that this sound could have lured Jeannie deeper into the forest, thinking that she would be found by finding the road. He then obtained the original search map and began to chart areas further in the direction she had travelled that were not searched as they were deemed too far. He then theorised that after she had passed by the trail, when night fell, she would be able to see the lights on the floor of Yosemite Valley and would perhaps have made a beeline to that spot. It would have meant passing the Bridal Vey Creek, which is dangerous in and of itself because of all the slippery granite present, and to even reach that point would have meant traversing the rugged, uneven ground and dense forestry. This is where the tracker made his prediction as to where she would be found. Now the tracker didn't find her, but two fishermen did, two months on from the initial disappearance on the 3rd of September. This wasn't the area that the tracker predicted, but it was somewhat close by, though even more difficult to reach than the initial predicted area. The fishermen said that they found her body in a small pool in the river. This was approximately three miles from where she disappeared, and around a mile away from the tracker's prediction. It was found that she had been there for a number of weeks and no one, including the tracker, understood how she managed to reach that location. An official statement read, The area is really inaccessible to anyone other than rock and mountain climbers. It's really rugged. And they said this for good reason. They themselves could not get to the body without using a helicopter to retrieve it. The park spokesman, Bob Clopine, said, the woman apparently walked into a rugged area of the park where there are no trails and the creekside granite rocks are especially slippery. The creek was rushing faster than in other years because of the huge snowpack melt. However, other park officials and some members of the police force were left with some scepticism after witnessing the area for themselves and after conducting the final investigation. Yosemite Park spokeswoman Nikra Kalagako said this, Investigators do not believe that the body could have been carried to that spot by the rushing waters because the creek is choked with debris. However, it's worth mentioning that while there was skepticism in relation to the official reasoning, searchers did not have a better theory. But the disappearance did leave some interesting and serious questions. Was this a simple case of getting lost in the woods or was some sort of third party involved? How did she end up in a location that was determined impossible to get to and inaccessible without serious rock climbing equipment? And why didn't the dogs pick up her scent at any point during the search? Now while the National Park Service lists 8 more disappearances after Jeannie, this one took place in 2005.
51-year-old Michael Allen Fissery was an experienced hiker and backpacker who had over 30 years of wilderness hiking experience and he disappeared on the 15th of June 2005. At the time, Michael had managed to obtain a wilderness permit for the backside of the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir located in Yosemite National Park. He had planned for a solo hike in which his journey would take him to Rancheria Falls, Tiltil Mountain, Lake Vernon and then to Beehive, before returning to his starting location at the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. Michael was spotted a few times that day, but the last time he was seen was when he started to make his way north up the Pacific Crest Trail towards the Tiltil Mountain. Michael's permit expired on the 19th of June and he had not returned. Michael's family grew increasingly worried and notified the authorities when they still hadn't heard from him on the 21st of June. Authorities, park rangers, search and rescue teams from five separate counties, special dog teams and helicopters flooded the area in swift time. Together, the search parties combed on and off the trail around Michael's route and initially couldn't find anything. It's not clear how much time had passed in the search, but at some point, searchers came across Michael's backpack off the trail near Tiltil Mountain. At the time of his disappearance, Michael had a topographical map, a camera and a bottle of water. Now, things are a little bit hazy with this discovery in that some sources indicate that all items were missing. Others state that the map and water were missing. Some state that all items were present and others don't mention it at all, so that's really great. Ultimately, the backpack was found which may or may not have been missing some or all of its contents. However, what was strange about this was that despite scouring a massive radius around the backpack on foot, in the air and with specialist dog teams, Michael's location was never found and at no point during the search could dogs pick up a scent. That mountain, the trail and its surrounding areas were combed by many people and no trace of him was ever found. Another oddity was that Michael seemed to have deviated from his route as per the findings of the backpack. This is something that Michael wouldn't normally do as he was said to be meticulous about his plans and with 30 years of experience, he knew very well the dangers of the land. One proposed theory was that could his deviation indicate that he was pushed in that direction? There were no signs of a struggle, so perhaps not physically, but could the presence of a third party have either blocked his path or through intimidation have moved him in that direction? Again though, it's important to clarify that the theory lies in the realm of speculation and there was no evidence present to point in that direction. Unless, if some of the contents of the backpack were missing, specifically the camera, then it could point in the direction of theft. Nevertheless, as many have pointed out, it was unusual that this experienced hiker with many years under his belt disappeared in the way that he did. What caused him to abandon his backpack that day? It's worth mentioning that the National Park Service spent half a million dollars on finding Michael, yet his disappearance has never been fully understood his body nor his clothes have ever been found. Six years later, on June the 17th, George Penker disappeared in the park during a hike to the top of Upper Yosemite Falls. George was a deeply religious man from Hawthorne, California, and on the day of his disappearance, he was visiting the national park with 80 members of his church group. 20, including George, made the decision to hike to Upper Yosemite Fall Trail while the others went elsewhere. The group was composed of various fitness levels, but all 20 individuals made it to the top at around 2.40pm without issue. It was at this time that the group decided to split into smaller parties so that they could go back down the trail at their own speed, whilst maintaining a reasonable distance from all 20 members. George was 5 foot 10, weighing 240 pounds and was said to be in a group at the back. It was during this hike that George went missing. At some point, George had fallen behind the group and no one had noticed that he was gone. When the group reformed at the start of the trail, it was said that the belief was that George must have hiked to Yosemite Valley floor by himself as they had plans to explore that area. The group went initially worried, but after realising that George had been gone for some time, the authorities were notified. 
an initial search was conducted that night around the area where George was last seen, and the rangers scoured the trail but couldn't locate him. The full-scale search operation was commenced early the following morning. Over 100 search and rescue personnel combed the area around the Yosemite Fall Trail and they said that they had no idea where he'd gone. At this point, two helicopters were deployed with thermal imaging technology on board and they couldn't locate him. Afterwards, six search dog teams joined the search, but the dogs never picked up his scent. MammothTimes.com reported this. The search area included 70 square miles of rugged terrain ranging in elevation from 4,000 feet above sea level to 8,000 feet above sea level. There were no clues as to Penka's whereabouts. Some present said that it was odd that George seemed to have gotten lost on this trail, as the trail is said to be clear and it would be obvious if one had deviated from it. It's worth mentioning that there were no signs of a struggle or animal predation. No members of the group reported hearing anything to suggest that George was in trouble. No screaming, shouting, thumps or anything of that nature. After almost one week of intensive searching, the operation was scaled back and at no point did the rangers find any indication of where he might have gone. Eight years later now, and George, nor his clothes or equipment have ever been found. Now, we're going to have to go back to 1981. I've covered this disappearance once before on the channel, but it is perhaps the most well-known disappearance in Yosemite National Park, and I feel it should be discussed in this video. According to the McCarthy News Service, 14-year-old Stacy Arras went missing on the 25th of July 1981. This was whilst on a horseback trip with her father, George Arras, near the Sunrise High Sierra Camp, located in Yosemite National Park. This was supposed to be a nice father and daughter trip, but it quickly turned into a nightmare. Alongside Stacy and George, there were 10 other members of the trip. The group had been riding on horseback for a few hours when they stopped at the camp in question to stay the night. The location is approximately 3 miles southeast of the Tenaya Lake and around 1.5 miles from Sunrise Lakes. After showering and cleaning herself up, Stacy wanted to hike a short distance from the camp to take some photos of the area. Stacy asked her father if he wanted to tag along with her, but he declined and said that it was okay for her to go ahead. The last conversation the pair would ever have was her father telling her to change from her flip-flops into her hiking boots. Approximately 100 yards away from the camp, a member of the group, known as Gerald Stewart, 77 years old at the time, was sitting on a rock. This was the direction Stacy was heading in as there was adult supervision nearby in the form of Gerald. Everyone present remembered witnessing Stacy and Gerald walking together on the trail. At this point, Stacy told Gerald that she was hiking to a nearby lake to take some pictures and Gerald offered to go along with her. Unfortunately, because of Gerald's age, he wasn't as fit as he used to be and he sat down somewhere along the trail. It's important to note that this was witnessed by the rest of the group and Stacy was also witnessed continuing along by herself. On July the 2nd, the Mariposa Gazette reported this. Mr. Stewart told park officials that he had spoken to a group from the direction that Stacy had taken, but they had not seen her. After hearing this, Gerald became worried and went back to camp to tell the others. A group was formed and they travelled down the trail, but they couldn't locate any sign of Stacy. The park service were immediately notified and the real search effort began. Around 150 people responded to the search. Over 60 of these individuals were with the Mountain Rescue Association. These individuals scoured the area and they couldn't find any trace as to what had happened. At first, animal predation was suspected, but the searchers could find absolutely no evidence of this at all. According to reports, the searchers did express some amount of confusion and wasn't sure where she could have gone. It was at this point that specialist dog search units were brought in alongside helicopter teams. The search lasted 11 days whilst the dogs and helicopters were deployed for 10. Despite an extensive search, the only clue found was the lens cap from Stacy's camera. This was found just inside the tree line from where she walked into the area by the lake. Stacy has never been found. In fact, no clues have ever surfaced as to where she may have gone. 
It's highly unlikely that Stacy had simply gotten lost as according to reports the trail is clearly marked. No one is really sure what took place here and it seems as though Stacy disappeared into thin air leaving no trace behind other than the lens cap. Could this point to some sort of struggle? Though there was no clear indication if that were the case. None of the reports mentioned disturbed ground or any sign found to suggest that this was the case. Could Stacy have intended to go missing intentionally? That also seems unlikely and again, no evidence was ever found to point in that direction. Ultimately, whatever took place here must have happened very quickly. What happened to Stacy Arras and where did she go? Please do leave a like if you liked the video or a dislike if you didn't. Feel free to share your honest opinion, I'd like to hear your thoughts. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank all of you that have subscribed to the channel and who share these videos, I appreciate it a lot and I can't thank you enough. I'd also like to say a massive thank you to my patrons, your support is massively appreciated, so thank you very much to those who have signed up. Anyway, do let me know what you thought of this one and you'll find all of the links in the description below. As always, thank you very much for watching, I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did, remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already, it helps me a lot. I hope that you have a great day or evening depending on where you are. Be safe guys and I'll catch you soon. Peace.